What is up guys? Today's video is going to be about classism and photography. It's going to be part of a video series on this topic and it's going to be about a lot more than just cameras being expensive. That is actually just the tip of the iceberg. This iceberg. I made it. Isn't it great? I tried to design this iceberg so that each tier represents a new stage in your photography career and also a new economic barrier that will filter out some percentage of the people attempting to pass through it. It is important to note for this video that these are barriers to financial and commercial success in photography and not barriers to your own enjoyment of and fulfillment through the art form itself. There are plenty of ways to find joy and express creativity through photography without ever getting past the first tier and a half of this iceberg. So I do really want you to keep that in mind as we get into the depressing reality of what lies below the surface. This video is going to be part of a series two, maybe three videos on this topic. We'll see, it depends on how long it takes me to get through the iceberg. But overall, I want this series to read sort of as the antithesis of one of those make six figures in your photography business this year type of videos. In fact, I treat that style of inspirational photography marketing content as the enemy in this series because those videos so effectively conceal the very real classist barriers that stand in the way of successful careers in photography. I'm not here to tell you how to advance your career as a photographer, even though the first few tiers of this iceberg might read that way. I'm actually here to talk ideologically about classism and how it intersects with this art form that I am personally so passionate about. I mean, dang, anybody who knows me can probably tell you that if there's two things I'm passionate about, it's photography and class struggle. But to give you a brief overview of what we're going to cover in this video, I am going to give you a kind of rundown of some key concepts that are going to be recurring throughout this video series and that will be necessary to understand what we're talking about, especially as we move our way down the tier list. And I'll also make some points that I wanted to make that didn't fit neatly into the tiers of the iceberg. And after that, I'm going to jump right into tiers one and two. And in the next video, we'll cover three and four and five and all the other tiers. Okay, let's talk ideology. <laughs> I have been collecting ideas for this topic for quite a few years now, and there have always been kind of a constellation of videos in this vein that I really wanted to make. I have been thinking about really interesting intersections between photography and colonialism, photography and nepotism, capitalism, racism, and originally I was planning to do individual videos for each one of these topics. I probably still will, honestly. <laughs> It'd be really interesting to investigate each one further. But midway through scripting a video about unrelatable photography origin stories, I had an idea for a way to tie all of these nebulous concepts of privilege and social capital together. Classism. Quickly, a definition of classism. It is the prejudice against or in favor of people belonging to a particular social class. Additionally, and importantly, it includes the systematic assignment of characteristics of worth and ability based on social class. Characteristics of worth and ability affected by social class? Doesn't that kind of contradict the philosophy of meritocracy? Don't all of those photography business gurus on YouTube really seem to root a lot of their ideas in the concept of meritocracy? We'll get to that. Classism is predicated on the idea that people are divided into social classes along economic lines, and an intersectional view of classism states that certain identity markers such as race and ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and ability also contribute to the encoding of one's social class. These identity markers exist individually on their own hierarchies. There's a gender hierarchy, a racial hierarchy, a hierarchy of ability, an economic hierarchy. Each of these hierarchies exists within and is constructed by the historical and cultural context, read prejudice, of a given society. In this video, this given society that I'm going to be referring to is the English internet and specifically the North American meat space. Are we calling it meat space? Not wanting to get too much more into the weeds here because I'm assuming if you're watching a long video series about classism, you probably are educated about privilege, but I'll just say that the more identity markers you possess that are among the top tiers of their respected hierarchies of privilege, the more social privilege you will have by default. Here we get the idea that straight, white, able-bodied men possess the most social privilege out of any other constellation of identity markers. And what do you know? Here are some of the most successful photographers in the world, and also the highest paid. I do see a lot of white men. <laughs> Handful of white women too, for sure. I guess white people probably just like photography more than anyone else. And that, that's why there's so many famous. No, it's not that. I think this is really good evidence for classism in photography because it shows that at some point, all but the most privileged artists are filtered out. And this is not one filter that's like, oh, either you have enough money to, to pay 50 grand to get this magazine to publish your work or not. It's a series of filters. 
Almost like you're descending into the depths below an iceberg. <laughs> see what, see what's the way the structure? Anyway, this is not a unique problem to photography. All art forms are like this for sure. All careers really, especially those in the arts. But it seems that with photography, these barriers are better concealed than they are in other art forms that we think of as being economically demanding. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit and we're gonna look at both tier one and tier two together. And I'm gonna let you know that the total financial cost associated with just crossing the top two tiers of this iceberg is between $2,000 and $6,000. Let's take a moment to think of some other art forms that cost that much just to get kind of started with your business. Woodworking, maybe? Ceramics, if you buy the kiln, uh, metal and glass working, lots of, lots of physical trade type arts, right? But you see a lot more aspiring photographers than you see aspiring glass workers, don't you? Because there's something about photography that conceals the economic barriers in a way that other expensive art forms don't. I think it's this. I think with woodworking or with metalworking or glassworking, you're making a physical product and you can see that product and you can understand by looking at that product how much it might have cost to produce. You can sort of get an idea of the raw materials, what kind of work and labor would have gone into it, the machines that must have been used to shape that object, and the craftsmanship required to operate those machines. And so by seeing the product, you get some idea of how much it would cost to be the person who made it. Probably not a great idea, but you can kind of ballpark it, right? But when a consumer looks at a photograph, they see the subject of that photograph, whatever it is a photo of. They don't see the photograph itself as the product that they're looking at. So unless you're already a fairly experienced photographer or somebody who's working in an adjacent field like fashion or marketing or something like that, you stand very little chance of estimating the cost of creating a certain photograph just by looking at it. Little case study real quick, this lecture from Lindsay Adler on creative in-camera techniques from B&H Photo. She shows you this picture and she says, it was created with flour and some tool that she tied up into a dress. And the way that she talks about creating this photo really sounds like she just went out and got a couple yards of tool and a bag of flour, put it together and made it happen sheerly through her own creative genius. And it is a beautiful photo, absolutely no shade to Lindsay Adler. I'm sorry that I'm picking on her in this video. But the issue here is that you could easily watch this lecture and think, dang, I wish I was creative enough to use flour and tool and get a result like this, because that is what goes into this is creativity. And you're not thinking about the $2,000 high-speed lighting setup or the $200 an hour studio space, and you're definitely not thinking about how she had the time, energy, and money to do all of this for free as a creative personal project, or about all of the storage space that she has in order to keep and access all of this gear, or the $3,000 camera, or the $1,200 lens, or the $300 Photoshop subscription that she used to edit this photo, or the $200 file storage, or any of the other costs associated with creating this image that she does not mention at all. I've watched this lecture a few times, and the thing that stands out to me is how casually she talks about creating these images, as though it really is just a matter of flower and tool. I know that she's coming from a good place in making this video. I know that she's trying to inspire young artists to go out and buy these simple props and put them together into something beautiful. But inadvertently, she is playing a role in concealing that class's barrier. Without talking about all those extra costs, she's basically telling people that you can go out and buy a camera and buy some props and make magic like this if you have the same creative genius that I have. And there's lots of people who do have that creative genius, but they don't have the bank accounts to back it up. Now, I definitely don't think that her lecture would have been better if she had gone into how much everything costs to produce. Definitely not. But I am saying that it would be worthwhile to stay conscious of these hidden costs while you're consuming this kind of content and not beat yourself up too much when you're not able to produce these high production quality type images when you're on a really tight budget. You might watch this video and think, well, shucks, I can afford $200 for a camera and certainly $30 for some props. And that's how you get so many people throwing themselves against these classes barriers and coming away feeling like it's their own personal shortcomings preventing them from advancing in their careers and in their art. So the archetypal photography guru type, and I'm sure if you're interested in photography as a business, you've watched like a million of these, but these people are telling you about how they built their six figure photography businesses. And they're giving you all of these great tips that really gloss over some of the key expenses that may not have felt significant to them, but which filter out a good portion of their audience. Recently, I was talking to a new photographer at Fashion Week and I casually recommended that they get a three head lighting kit for $200 a piece, which is sort of entry level and I would consider that to be fairly cheap, but this photographer was absolutely taken aback that I would casually suggest dropping $600 on some pieces of equipment. And then when they later went on to absolutely marvel at the photos that I had taken with my own three head lighting kit backstage at Fashion Week, 
and compared them to their own photos, which were lit by the model light from one of my strobes, it really drove home for me exactly how many economic barriers I had already moved past without really realizing. So looking again at the top two tiers of this iceberg, when I say that you have to pay for these in order to get started with photography, you may be looking at this and thinking, no, 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 checkmate, Yvonne. I don't need any of these things to get started as a photographer because I have an iPhone and iPhones take pictures. Yes, yes they do. And if you tell a group of photographers that you take all of your pictures on a phone, they will tell you to go buy a camera if you want to call yourself a photographer. Because there is an economic barrier to enter this club, and we have all crossed it. And if you want to be in this club, you have to cross it too. It has nothing to do with your physical ability to create an image. In fact, it's your willingness, read, ability, to invest in the tools of the trade that will induct you into the identity of a photographer. The level of disdain that camera-wielding photographers have for phone users, phonographers, colloquially, is a pretty obvious example of classism right at the outset. <laughs> and it's something that I have actually been trying to beat out of myself since I recognized it for what it was. Well, they should have a camera. You can't take good photos on a phone. Well, there's lots of people with cameras who don't take good photos either, so trust me, that ain't it. Well, maybe it's just my personal preference that I like photos that were taken on cameras better than photos that were taken on phones. Maybe it is personal preference, or maybe it's classism. The iceberg. I wish I could score this video with copyrighted music so I'd do like a fan of the opera, like organ hit. Just picture that in your head. The iceberg. The first two tiers of this iceberg are literally just me listing how much things cost. In part two of this video series, we're gonna get into more nuanced concepts like time, energy, and social capital and how those relate to classism. But for now, sit back and be awed by the sheer number of dollars that even your local hobbyist photographer has sunk into making art this way. <laughs> Entry number one, cameras are expensive. Yes, they are. If you want a good DSLR camera, it's going to be like $400 minimum. Yes, you can get a camera for less than that, but I wouldn't. I think you could get one for as low as 150 bucks that's usable and has basic functionalities, but if you want one that's actually gonna support your growth for like a sustained period of time as a photographer, you're looking at like $500 upfront. If you buy secondhand, you can knock a few hundred dollars off that price tag, but honestly, you'd be much better off paying $500 for a secondhand $900 camera than paying $150 for a secondhand $500 camera. You could also buy a film camera. Those are way cheaper, like way cheaper, but film is expensive. And we'll talk about that shortly right after we talk about how lenses are expensive. You can't just buy a camera, you have to buy a lens. Sometimes the camera will come with a lens. It'll come with a kit lens or a portrait lens, like a 50. And you can take this and you can shoot a few portraits and some close-ups of your friend's dogs and pets and flowers from the neighborhood, but you will hit a point pretty quickly where the tight frame of a 50 millimeter lens or the narrow aperture of a kit lens really starts to impair your ability to get the shots that you want. I'll let you in on a little secret. I shot with just a 50 millimeter lens for the first like two and a half years of being a photographer. <laughs> and I don't regret it because I didn't have enough money to upgrade, but as soon as I did upgrade, oh my God, I haven't shot with a 50 since. <laughs> I have, that's a joke, but barely. But let me tell you, all of those fancy nature shots and fashion shots and landscape shots that you see in magazines, none of those were taken on a 50, and certainly none of them were taken with a kit lens. It's too bad, too, because if you want to upgrade to something more useful, you're looking at dropping at least $1,000 on a new lens, even if you buy used. <laughs> I remember the first time that I took out my entire paycheck in cash to go and buy a lens from a guy on Facebook Marketplace, and I've never felt like more of a stupid idiot in my life. It's not unreasonable either. It's not like these companies are price gouging us. There's like this how it's made that shows how they make camera lenses, and oh my god, it is so meticulous. It absolutely justifies the price. So there's just no getting around it. Lenses are expensive because they have to be. And so is film. <laughs> Entry number three, film is expensive. So if you don't wanna buy a DSLR and you prefer that 35 millimeter sheen, then you're looking at film photography. If you can, please get some practice with a digital camera before you blow through your retirement savings trying to figure out how to use your light meter. A roll of color film right now costs between 11 and $17 unless you're Canadian and your money is worthless, in which case it's more like 14 to $21. But that's not the expensive part, actually. The expensive part is getting it developed, which is also an entry on this list. Film development is expensive. I pay about $21 per roll of film I get developed, 
but if you live in some parts of Europe, you might be paying up to $41. <laughs> some people like to develop film themselves to save money, but that takes time and storage space and still costs a fair amount of money, as well as specialized knowledge that takes time to develop. So instead, some people like to have the lab develop their film and then they get the negatives and scan them themselves, which will save a fair bit of money as well, but that also costs time. and. We haven't really touched on time yet, but we're gonna talk about it in part two, so put a little pin in that because time is also a class privilege. So with that, we're wrapping up tier one, and if you've gone the film photography route, you've spent a little bit less money, but if you've gone the digital photography route, you've paid somewhere between $500 and $3,500, depending on how entry level your setup is and whether you've got things secondhand or not. But all of these purchases are pretty much useless unless you've got some of the things on tier two. First item on tier two is computer processing power. I've had a few friends get stuck on this one after buying a camera and a lens and shooting a few photos and having a great time and then they realize that they actually need a computer that is capable of processing a few hundred photos at a time. You need one that isn't gonna crash constantly or overheat or run out of memory or just be prohibitively slow. You also need one that's capable of running a program that's able to load, sort, and edit your photos. If you're constantly battling a slow computer while trying to sort through lots of photos, your desire to take lots of photos will quickly evaporate, and I've seen it happen. And it's not just sorting them too, it is editing them, which brings me to the Adobe subscription. You need a way to edit your photos. It doesn't have to be Adobe, but it probably should be. <laughs> There's a lot of photographers who get by without an Adobe subscription. This is like not a mandatory one, but it's definitely gonna be a lot more useful than you think, and I'm sure after like a year of photography, you will come to realize that. Whether it is retouching or just adjusting lighting, color, crop, straightening things out or removing distracting elements, most photographers do use Photoshop or Lightroom or both. There are other programs available, but nothing good and free. You're pretty much doomed to be paying for some kind of editing software. Well, unfortunately, running Photoshop is no minor task. It takes a computer with a certain amount of processing power, and if you don't have that amount of processing power, you're out of luck. My last computer got stolen in 2019, but it couldn't run Photoshop, and so up until 2019, I couldn't really edit any of my photos on my computer. <laughs> when I clicked on the Photoshop icon, it would just open a pop-up and my computer would apologize to me for not being capable of running it. I have a friend whose computer can run Photoshop, but it can't use certain tools like the heel brush or liquify that require computational power to some degree. And I pretty much use those tools every single time I open the program. And you might say, well, Yvonne, can't you take good photos and get away without editing them if the photographer is good enough? Sure. Yeah, as a hobbyist, yes, but absolutely not as a professional. I do not know a single professional photographer or, or even a hobbyist photographer who does not edit their photos. It's a harsh reality, but I often see photographers on Reddit bragging about their unedited shots and I look at those shots and I can always see room for improvement. If you're leaving that room unexplored, you'll be stuck here at tier two for a long time. So you can get a combined Photoshop and Lightroom subscription for 26 bucks a month or $312 per year. So buy that and then take the time to learn how to use them and we're gonna be talking about time later on. But in that time, you will also be amassing a large number of images. And so you're gonna need file storage, which is expensive. I use three 128 gigabyte memory cards, which each cost me around 120 bucks. And I also have three five terabyte hard drives, which are between 150 and 170. You might not need multiple hard drives and memory cards when you're first starting out, but I would advise you have at least two memory cards and at least one hard drive, but you should probably have two because you need the backup. I know you're not going to, but you really should. So go out and buy a $170 hard drive and a $100 memory card, and that wraps up tier two. <laughs> so all told, as I mentioned earlier in this video, to get past tiers one and two, you're gonna be spending somewhere between $2,000 and $6,000. And then an additional $300 per year after that on your Photoshop subscription. <laughs> and congratulations, once you've spent that, you are now an amateur photographer probably not good enough to actually get paid for your work, so it is gonna be some time before you're able to recoup those costs. But we are gonna talk about time in next week's video. I'm really excited to talk about time, can you tell? You can save up a bunch of money before you quit your job to try and be a freelance photographer, but you can never save up time. You just have to have it. That wraps up this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this video is interesting to you. I hope this sounds like a cool series. I hope to see you back here next week. If you liked it, leave a comment, leave a like, hit that bell icon to get notified every single time I post. I will be back next Monday with a new video on this topic. We will be addressing the next few tiers on this iceberg. Thank you guys so much for watching. I want you guys to stay sharp and don't forget to keep shooting. Bye guys.